Hello, everybody. Up and welcome to the study session. We're on with Ethric Double, Chapter Two. Yes. Uh, so, those of you who are joining us today, this is where we are. And uh, we finally finished Chapter One. <laughs> yes, we finally finished Chapter One. So, let's start off with a short prayer. Kindly close your eyes, connect tongue to the palate, inhale and exhale, relax the body. Oh, okay, fine. I forgot about that part. Hold on. Keep your eyes closed. Feel yourself in the presence of our teacher and the Supreme Being. Let's invoke. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, we humbly ask for your great, great blessings, for your divine guidance for your light, for your knowledge, for your understanding, all through the session. To our beloved and respected teacher, Grandmaster Chor Koksui, to Lord Maha Guruji Meli, to Buddha Kwanian, Buddha Sakyamuni, Gautama Buddha, to Lord Christ, to Yehoshua Bar Miriam, to Lord Shiva, Lord Ganesha, especially to the angels, the great teachers, the great masters of theosophy, the angels of knowledge, light and power, of communication of our respective internets and Wi-Fis to our soul and divine self, we ask for your divine light, for your divine love, for your mercy, for your guidance, to help us to have a deeper and clearer understanding of these priceless teachings being imparted to us today. We ask you to help us to absorb and assimilate this knowledge and to use it to become better divine instruments, to hopefully also become better healers, to help make this world a better place. We continue to offer ourselves <clears throat> as instruments in your work. With thanks and in full faith, so be it. With gratitude, with deep respect and love. Thank you. You may slowly open your eyes with a smile. Atma Namaste, everybody. Atma Namaste. So we'll move to the PPT straight away. So we're starting off with the new chapter. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's only that this is coming. All right. All right, so starting off with um, chapter two. Usually it goes away. All right, so let's move to chapter two. Wow. We have thunder and lightning in our city here in Bangalore. So it's called prana or vitality, yes. And so it starts off with explaining how from the sun, yes, from Lord Surya, Lord Savitur, the solar logos, we actually have three distinct forces that come down. At least these are the only three that they are aware of a hundred years ago. And, excuse me. And so the names of these three are basically Fohat, which is, uh, okay, let's, let's keep the name. So it's Fohat, it's Prana and Kundalini. And so it mentions here that Fohat is something that we are all aware of thanks to science. We are aware of these different physical forces and the interesting thing about this is it can be converted from one form of energy to another, whether it's electricity, whether it's light, whether it's heat, whether it's sound, whether it's uh, chemical affinity, motion, and so on and so forth. And so they say this is one where it is convertible from one to another, right? And that is in general for her. The second one is prana, which you and I are very familiar with. Uh, this is a vital force, as we would call it. And... At that point, uh, you've got to understand that medicine is also something new. 
right? So Western medicine is also new. And at that point, there were very few people who understood what prana is. But I think today in medicine, they are aware of energy. They may not call it prana like you and I do, but they are aware that there is something called energy uh, to a large extent. But since there is no scientific uh, evidence that is clear for them, they kind of put it aside. Uh, now, the last one is Kundalini. Now, the Kundalini energy, again, for us uh, who do regular meditation practices and we've done our Hatha Yoga, we have a greater understanding of it or even achieving oneness with the higher soul. And this energy is, again, latent uh, within us. And this is something that people are aware of more in the spiritual realm. But overall, the common man is not aware of the Kundalini. Yes. And so these are the three main sources or forces of energy that or uh, distinct forces that come from the sun that we need to be aware of. Yeah. So before I continue, I'll allow Amit to say what he would like. It's pretty straightforward. Um, actually, I always wondered where prana came from. When, when I see the air prana, I'm like, uh, the air prana is here, but how did it, you know, how did it start? And um, uh, how does it get replenished over and over again? You know, something, um, is it like one mass of air prana that came in and we're slowly absorbing it? Or is it something that's continuously being moving? And then when we learn prana healing, um, obviously we know that energy always has to move and has to uh, move in and move out. Otherwise it stagnates. So then my thinking was, where is this prana coming from? So according to this book, um, air prana, all these types of prana comes from the sun. So the sun is the supreme source of prana. So although there are various types of chi, prana, energy, they can be broadly categorized as three types of forces or energy. So you have the main source, which is the sun or the solar logos, I think that's what it means. And um, uh, it's, it's how uh, I think he's saying the solar logos, which interpenetrates every cell of the solar system. And we look at that in this chapter, including every cell of the etheric body of the sun, uh, which sustains life and helps with evolution. Uh, for now, I think this is just given a rough idea. And I think we're going to focus more on the second one, which is prana or vitality. Right. And so uh, we've, we have to understand, luckily for us in our school, Masachoa has not only spoken about just prana, uh, with reference to healing, he's, of course, uh, just to remind all of us, we have air prana, sun prana, and ground prana. Now, uh, when we talk about the solar logos, we also have to remember that this is the being, yes? So when we refer to God and we pray, it's normally our, our reach, our prayer reaches only till the level of the solar logos. And so the solar system is where you and I are. And of course, there is, um, th there is something beyond that. But with reference to the solar system, you've got to understand the center is the sun and the sun is a physical representation of the solar logos or the solar being. And so to remember that everything comes out of that. Yeah. And so the existence of all, uh, all things, all matter that we can see, not see is all part of this. Now, one of the things to understand is, though these are the three forces that come from the sun, these cannot be converted one to another. Like the Kundalini cannot become Prana, Prana cannot become Fohat. So that is something uh, to understand at this point, right? And another thing is, uh, since we are talking about theosophy, let's also connect this to the outpouring. The outpouring that also comes from this great being, the solar deity or the Lord Savitur or the, or the solar logos. And so from the first outpouring, remember the first, first outpouring from the textbook of theosophy, this first outpouring is always in relation to the third logos, yeah? The third aspect of God, uh, which you and I refer to, yes, uh, which is easier for us uh, from Master Joa's school. So from the first outpouring, which is connected with the third aspect of God, that is the primary source which uh, works with the manufacturing of this, uh, the uh, chemical elements. Yes, this, is, this appears as Fohat, as the book says, right? Now from the second outpouring, which is connected to the second aspect of God, right, or the second logos, that is from where we actually get prana. Prana is one of the aspects from the second uh, outpouring and the second aspect of God or the second logos, right? So from the first logos, third aspect, you get pohat. Yes, that's the first one we mentioned. Prana is from the second outpouring, from the second aspect of God, or let's just say divine love. Yes, and the first one with reference to um, the third aspect, which is usually divine, 
Light. Intelligence, yeah, light. And moving on, the last one, Kundalini, that we are referring to. Kundalini is further developed. And how does Kundalini further develop? The You've got to remember, when we're coming down into existence, when you and I uh, come from God, we come lower and lower into grosser and grosser matter. And at this point, we've actually come all the way down. And now we are taking the U-turn to go up, right? We're trying to evolve to become better and better. And so this is called the ascending arc. And so the Kundalini is associated with the ascending arc, where the energy is moving upwards back to God, back to union with who we came from. And at the same time, it is also connected with the first outpouring, right? So just wanted to connect those aspects for you and me, right? Uh, so going back, forehead is first outpouring. Kundalini is also first outpouring. However, forehead is with chemical elements, whereas Kundalini is with the ascending arc going upwards. And prana is from the second aspect of God and also the second outpouring. Okay, so um, so that makes sense. Uh, when I listen to that, uh, if you say the third aspect of God, you're looking at the creative aspect. Um, uh, so you need the electricity and all these things to create um, inventions, those kind of things. And if you're looking at the second aspect where pranas come from, uh, as we know, prana is a life force and it sustains life. And uh, without prana, you cannot be alive. Uh, and um, the preserving aspect is the second aspect. And Kundalini is the power aspect, which is the first aspect. Uh, that is why when you awaken the Kundalini, uh, the nature of Kundalini is actually, although it's matter, it, it's, uh, the nature of Kundalini is um, activating. So it power, makes you more powerful. Number two, it uh, enables the body to withstand more energy. So it upgrades. So you need power. So it's a power aspect. It makes the body more powerful. So you can, uh, so with Kundalini, the body needs Kundalini energy to make it more powerful so it can handle the divine energy. So these are how the three aspects are viewed. No, there is no third aspect. Eh? It's just the first outpouring. Uh, it's just still the third aspect. It says from the first aspect, first outpouring. Both are first outpouring. The forehead is first outpouring, even Kundalini is. Yes. Only the second aspect is Prana. Okay. And what, what Sumi was talking about, so I was, we were, I remember, I don't know the whole thing, but Master was talking about the evolving and, uh, you know, I was asking, everything is evolving in, in the world. And he says, no, not everything is evolving. There is uh, things, see, evolving means dematerialization. So you're trying to let go, you're trying to evolve. Um, but there are beings in charge of materialization, bringing things down. So while things are evolving, not everything is evolving. And anyway, that's not part of the topic. Right, so sometimes they call, you know, the, when you're coming down, they call it involution. And when we're going up, you know, the it's ascending evolution. arc, uh, which is the Kundalini, which we're talking about, is the evolution. And right now we are part of evolution. You and I, <laughs> we're referring to that, yes? And uh, we go to the next word, I mean, which we are familiar with, which is prana. So looking at it from the Sanskrit text, they say that pra is fourth. I might be pronouncing it wrong. I, I, I apologize. I've never learned Sanskrit. So P-R-A is fourth and A and An is breath. Yeah, that which moves or gives life as well is An. So pra An, yes, or prana means breath, fourth, life breath, or living energy, yes, that's the closest that English uh, could uh, translate Sanskrit. However, you and I know a lot more about this prana. Now, the prana that we're talking about is just, just not the sun, earth, and air prana that we use for healing. The aspect of prana here is much more than what you and I are aware of, yes? And so we're going to go more into depth with that at this point. Could you finish that paragraph? Okay, so, so when you talk about uh, the prana, the aspect of prana, we've got to understand that this prana exists everywhere. Since it comes from the solar being, everything that is in the solar system has this prana. And we've we spoken about uh, the seven uh, levels, right? And so each level, as this energy comes from the highest, right, going through the first elemental kingdom, second elemental kingdom, third elemental kingdom, coming to the mineral kingdom, going into the plant kingdom, going into the animal kingdom, and then, of course, where we are. Through all this, yes, you have this prana existing. So prana exists 
because without the existence of prana, whatever is there cannot continue to live and survive, right? It has a completely different existence without prana. And so we will look at how prana kind of, uh, into, it, it's interwoven into everything that exists around us. And so you've got to remember that there are pranas, but there are also pranas that are separate for each of those different uh, stages or each of those different kingdoms as well. All right. So I wanted to look at the quotes better. So it says, uh, there is only one life, one consciousness, prana the one. So here, uh, prana is being used to address ev uh, the life energy in every being. All right. Um, because it says, so it's, and it says life on each plane requires prana off that plane. All right. So the word is off. So here prana is just being used in a very general form. So you have to be very, it's, it gets very confusing because prana can mean anything. It's like chi. All right. Um, so instead of emotional energy on the astral plane, we say astral prana. All right, because they're saying each plane requires prana of that plane. So if you're looking at the prana or emotional energy of the astral plane, you say astral prana. Instead of mental energy on the mental plane, we see mental prana. So prana is being used uh, um, is being used as a principle here, not as physical prana as we might think straight away. Because when pranic healers think prana, they're like, ah, life force, physical prana, you know. It, it's not that one. It's just talking in a general sense. All right, so when you say uh, will, uh, which is one of the like uh, seven principles of a human being. Uh, so there's physical will, there's astral will, there's mental will or mental endurance, spiritual will, and so on. So here it can get a bit confusing as we, so in this chapter, we use prana, uh, since pranakulas use it just as physical vitality, um, and we use energy as describing other things. Here they're using prana for everything. All right. And to understand the quote by Indra, I didn't understand because it says, I am prana, daughter of prana's life. So I, I looked it up uh, to see the whole quote and see what it could mean. Um, and it says, um, there is a conversion, okay, a conversation in the Upanishads, blah, blah, blah. I am prana. Meditate on me as life, um, as immortality. Prana is life, life is prana, immortality is prana. Prana is immortality. As long as prana dwells in the body, so long surely there is life. That is the same thing that Master said in his book. He says, in other words, for life to exist, the body must have prana or chi or life energy. <laughs> All right, so page seven. So that is what it meant. Um, have you covered this Munda, Munda thing? <laughs> no, I haven't covered it. Okay, you've got a Munda comment, chef. <laughs> what my pronunciation of these uh, Indian words might be a little bit off. <laughs> okay, uh, so so moving on, yes, uh, Lord Indra did mention that, and uh, it says that prana here clearly means the totality of the life forces. In the Munda Kopanishad, it is stated that from Brahma, the One, comes prana or life. Prana is also described as Atma in its outgoing activity. From Atma, this prana is born. That is from the uh, Prasnopanishads. And uh, Shankara, yes, says that prana is Kriya Shakti, the Shakti of doing. And I would also say, based on what Master Chua tells us, it's also the prana of manifestation or materialization not of knowing, it's not with reference to knowledge, but actually getting something done. It is classed as one of the seven elements, right? And so the seven elements are the seven regions, the seven sets, and also uh, with reference to that, they've given you prana, mana, ether, fire, water, uh, earth, and air. And so we will go into this a little later. But to understand what I mentioned even earlier, that prana exists in every plane, in every level, Right? It has its own prana, and we'll understand more about this existence of this type of energy, which is required in, in every other plane, in every body with reference to that plane that we also have. So we're going to go into that uh, at this point. But to understand, since prana comes from this supreme uh, solar being, right? So from that solar being, anything that exists within that solar being, which is you and I, remember that it is in, it is in him that we move and have our being, yes, and our life. 
it exists within that. And so everything that exists within that, uh, the planets that exist, the, the animals that exist, the birds that exist, that you and I exist, the stone that exists, everything has this uh, prana that interpenetrates it. Yes, giving it life, giving it sustenance. And so we will go into that uh, more in a bit. Yes, um, Amit, you want to continue? Um, I'll go to the breath of life. Okay. Um, so the paragraph uh, starting from the verse, um, this verse uh, in the Mundaka Upanishad and the uh, discussion about Atma, uh, from Atma, Prana is born. So from Atma, Prana is born, Prana is Kriya Shakti, etc. It talks not only again about etheric life force, but Prana in general. So the chapter, actually, if you look, it starts from a macro viewpoint, all right, um, from a macro viewpoint. And uh, then he goes into, uh, there are three types of unique energy, for Hat Konlini Prana. Then he goes to bring it down, all right, to the, from the three types, and he focuses on one type, Prana. And then the macro viewpoint of Prana is going to be looked at, uh, mentioning it as life force of the universe, of the Brahman. Uh, you have to observe the above quote is not mentioning Brahma which is the intelligent aspect, but actually Brahman, there's a difference, right? Which is the supreme, supreme. being. Uh, when he says Brahman, the ones come prana, based on the previous description, that's the sun. So I'm presuming it's the solar pra para Brahman they're talking about. So what I think he's trying to point out is that there are many types of prana, from cosmic prana all the way down to etheric prana. And the rest of the chapter will deal more with, uh, I think, um, the different types of prana there are, and its impact on us, and uh, etheric prana vitality. Um, and the types of prana that deal with the physical body as well. Correct. So it's going to come closer and closer to what we are familiar with. That is the dense body, uh, the energy body, and the existence of prana within this. But also connecting it to the astral and the mental body. Yeah? So that's where we're going to go in. So we're coming from, like uh, Amit said, from out there, bringing it closer and closer to home. All right, uh, so in Hebrew, they say that the breath of life, yes, uh, was uh, the great being uh, breath, breathed, if I could use that word, into the nostril of the first man, which is called Adam. And uh, he says this prana that we're talking about at that point is not just prana, but it is also the second principle, which is karma. So prana combined with karma is what was given to Adam to help uh, to make probably what you call the vital spark and give the breath of life to man, which uh, then sustained that human race. So uh, it is there in man, it is there, it says here, in beast or insect or, or anything that's physical and uh, that is of the material world. Uh, now, you've got to remember that uh, in the Bible, the story of how you have this, this whole existence happening they talk about it as the seven days and, uh, and then they say that on, on the last day, uh, God actually took a break, right? And that's why they say you need to keep that last day holy and you don't do other activities. You just connect to God. And so that's called the Sabbath day or the Sunday. To understand that, you've got to remember that obviously God is not going to create it, okay, on Monday I'm going to do this, Tuesday I'm going to do this, Wednesday. It's got to do with the different, uh, you know, remember the rounds? Uh, we talk about and so as it moves from one level to another to another and even the existence of life starts to change from one to another to another till we come into uh, the point where you have human beings uh, where we are no longer androgynous yes one uh, where we have both sexes but we actually divide into male and female right we start to have separate bodies that look different and have uh, a, a different uh, gender to it and so that has got to do with the races. And so when you look at the Bible, when the Bible talks about the different days, it's actually not just uh, the day that you and I know as a Monday. It's got to do with the movement from one round to another with reference to us uh, evolving to become human beings. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> the breath of life, I'm just there. You're there? Yeah, just this. You finish the next part because it continues, right? It it translates this into this. All right. So um, to, to continue with the next uh, paragraph, translated, okay, into more Western term, what is prana? Yes. So prana on the physical plane, it is best described as vitality, right? Or the vital force. That is the integrating energy that coordinates all physical matter that you and I know, whether it's the molecules, the 
uh, the atoms. I would even go to the point of with reference to our organs, our bones, our skin, everything that we know of to keep this whole thing, holding this together. Yes, uh, this entire definite organism that you and I call, say, the human body is through prana. I remember this was one of the questions that Master Cho asked me. He says, how does all this energy stay within the body? Right? And, and the answer is here. And it says, it is the life breath within the organism, the portion of the universe, which is the life breath, appropriated by a given organism during the period of bodily existence as we speak of today as life. So when we talk about life, it's actually the prana that exists within us. Because once this prana is taken out, the cells still continue to exist, but they are not unified. They do not coordinate with each other. They do not work together as one whole. Because the prana that comes down is the one that does this. And I think for me, uh, since we're talking about the physical form, the physical form is associated with one of those uh, seeds that we talk about in the soul course. So we have the Sutra Atma, and so that, through that uh, connection that we have from high above, from a high soul, through that comes this first seed. And in that seed is the entire program of our physical, what we call the physical body that we have today. And so through that seed emanates this prana, right, that comes through that. And it kind of coordinates the entire aspect of our physical body from the skin, through the bones, through our muscles, through all those important vital organs that we have. And they, they make it look very beautiful. They say this is the web of life and it is this golden web of inconceivable fineness and delicate beauty formed out of a single thread of buddhic matter, a prolongation of the sutra atma, uh, within the mesh of which the kosa atoms are then built. And so through this energy, through this sutra atma that comes down, this energy radiates, this prana radiates to keep everything in place, helping it work with each other, coordinates our entire body, allowing it to sustain work and move as one being. Yes. So if this is the body of Sumi, then this, this body is coordinated by this, uh, this um, single strand that comes down and then radiates the prana out of it to keep the whole body uh, as one, as, as a whole. And when this energy again is pulled out, then the same thing happens. The existence of this body is no longer uh, what you and I would refer to as Sumi. It's just something that continues to exist till all the cells can survive and then it, it decomposes or disintegrates. Mm -hmm. So came to yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so just like Sumi said. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, honestly, I found this part very confusing. All right, because when I read this, uh, okay, the Hebrews speak of breath of life, which is called Nefesh. Uh, for me, in chapter one uh, of Miracles through Pranic Healing, the breath of life is called Ruah or Ruach, right? Um, God gave Adam the breath of life, Ruah or Ruach. That's what Master would always say. So I started thinking, uh, okay, in that case, what is Master talking about? Uh, Master is comparing Prana in that case, in that scenario, as life energy. All right. So in the context, uh, Master describes it as, um, uh, Master Chua describes it as, uh, describe life energy because without it, the body would die. So it doesn't make the body alive. That prana that he's talking about, the ruach, it keeps the body alive, right? In, in that case, yes, it's vital life energy because without it, the body's dead. So slowly I was trying to understand. Then I was like, what is nefesh? You know, and I thought it's supposed to be ruach. And if you speak to some uh, Jewish people, they use it interchangeably. Uh, nefesh, Ruach. So we started to investigate this. Um, I believe in some part of Madame Blavatsky's work, uh, one of my colleagues told me, uh, it, meant, it mentions Nefesh as animal soul also, lower soul, or even incarnated soul. So in order to uh, get further clarification, you have to look at the whole Bible. And then yeah, you'll, you'll find in the book of Job, uh, which is part of the Bible, chapter 12, verse 10, it talks about nefesh and ruach in the same line. So that's something that I wanted to get, like where is it together so I can compare the two, okay? Because if you just ask a normal pranic healing, what is the breath of life? They're gonna say it's ruach or prana, right? Then what is nefesh? So if you look at the quote, uh, I put the quote for you from the two versions, the new King James version and the King James. It says, in the new version, it says, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind, all right? 
And it says, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of mankind. So they've used soul and life interchangeably, right? Um, now, if you look, since the words are Jewish, it, Nefesh and Ruach, if you look at the Orthodox Jewish Bible, it says, in whose yad is the nefesh of every living being, uh, of every living thing, and the Ruach of, I have no idea, they, are, they pronounce it very uh, differently, so I'm not um, that good at it, or I don't know how to do it. That's okay. That's, um, that's human beings. That's it. So of, human, whatever of human, is. of mankind, human beings, whatever. All right. So, um, so here, if you see the difference here, you can see the difference between nefesh and ruach. So uh, the word prana here is being used to describe various concepts. Here, nefesh is used to describe life energy. What Sumi was talking about in the sense of energy that comes through the cord of life and goes into the physical permanent seed or life seed, radiating outwards, making the body alive. It makes the body alive, right? So it says, is the life of every being, okay? So it makes the body alive. Um, how do we know this? Know this? Um, if you read on, if you read on the next part, if nefesh is translated into more Western terms, prana on the physical plane, if you read that paragraph that Sumi was talking about, um, it describes this energy as vitality as the integrating energy, the key word is integrating energy that coordinates the physical molecules together and holds them together as a definite uh, organism. This is what Sumi was talking about. So it says in the book, it says, it is the life breath within the organism, the portion of the universal life breath appropriated by a given organism during the period of bo bodily existence that we speak of as life. So it's a portion of the universal life breath that is appropriated or borrowed or taken, a portion, taken. a portion taken by the given organism during the period of, only during the period of bodily uh, uh, existence that we are speaking of as life. So just to, um, so to make and maintain the etheric body, you need this life energy or nefesh. So just to confirm what's in the book, it says, uh, it says were it not for the presence of prana. So this energy, that it has an integrating factor is what Masachua describes as a quality. So what they're talking about, this prana, is not like physical prana. It's uh, what Masachua, it's a particular type of life energy. And I remember Master mentioning in one of the classes that it's different from prana. But it's a special life energy that comes down and he says it makes the body alive. I remember very clearly because I was thinking of Frankenstein. It's alive. I was, <laughs> my body was young. So uh, anyway, so, so, um, so Master is mentioning one of the, it's different, right? It's a, he says, he says, I don't know what to call it. He says, it's a special life energy that comes down. So here they're using the word prana for several terms, just like how the word, for example, Holy Spirit in the Bible is used for different meanings. It could mean the descent of the Holy Spirit. It could mean you, the Holy Spirit. It could mean macro level Holy Spirit. So it's very confusing. Um, so it requires some more thinking. So it is the special energy that, this, that gives this body the ability to absorb a lot of pranic energy in the first place. It is through nefesh that ruach can be used in the first place. So I hope you got it. See, for example, in the body, there are millions or billions of cells, but they act as one. You see, this arm has millions and billions of cells. It's part of the body, but these hundreds and millions and billions of cells, they act as one. It's integrated. It's synthesized, right? Or coordinated. You try and making so this life energy or this prana is the one that keeps this, the, the quality of it is it, it, it keeps the body integrated or alive. All right. So that's what Master Chua says in his book. The same thing that is said. He says the physical permanent seed or life seed gives life to the physical body. From the highest soul, the life energy, soul life energy is infused into the physical permanent seed from where it is distributed in different parts, making the body whole and integrated. All right, so both are talking about integration of the cells. All right, it's, it's a very special type of energy because you try making 100,000 people, not billion people act as one. You try, forget about 100,000, try making 10 people act as one. It's not easy. So it's a very different type of energy. So to summarize, uh, you have nefesh uh, or consciousness, giver of life. So it's the special life energy that gives life to the body, integrates all the cells, keeps the body together, and ruach that sustains the body and is the actual breath, both are required. So if the energy level is low, the consciousness of the jiva leaves the body. So without ruach, the nefesh cannot stay either, right? So if you don't have enough prana in your body, 
the point, you know, there's no point of keeping it integrated. So, so that's why usually sometimes in Jewish writing, uh, writing nefesh and ruach are interchangeably used. Just like in India, when somebody dies, they say the pran has left the body or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, so, but pranic energy is continuously coming in and going out of your body. So, like, how old do you mean it's left the body? It's always coming in. Oh my God! Right now, I, I, I my health rays have exhaled prana. So, am I dead? It's not. They're not talking about that prana. It's used interchangeably. So here, even nefesh is uh, being confused with prana. So, but so the pran is also what what we call pran is also called the nefesh or the life energy. Technically, the life energy was just stopped or removed by the high soul, and then the soul left the body, or jivatma left the body. The prana we learned in chapter one stays in the body. The cells uh, stay in the body, slowly decay. Whatever's left of that prana, okay. But the nefesh is the one that leaves the body. All right. Now, uh, it talks about this mesh that Sumi was describing that's beautiful. Actually, if you look at it, it the, I remember one of my, a long time ago, someone was describing the energy coming down from, from the spiritual cord as actually one. And then it just, you know, it's like, you know, if you split it, it splits into thousands of strings and goes like all like, like threads all through your body, around your body. That's how Clermont looks. And when Master Chol, he says, if you look at the energy, he says there are lines like this, and lines like this, okay? So it forms like a web, and the shape is rectangular in energy. So the flow of energy is, according to Master Chua, rectangular in, in, in nature, all right? Uh, that's at least what Master Chua told us. Um, now, what is interesting is um, they're talking about this mesh, but uh, people have evolved since then, and as you evolve, so if you practice higher, higher arhatic, you actually change this configuration, it's no longer um, like in higher erratic, your energy body, like level five, your energy body starts to change. It becomes triangular in nature. As a matter of fact, you produce crystal body. That's why in the advanced book, you have the golden body of Babaji with some crystals around it. So your body becomes the sparkles. crystallized. Sparkles. Okay. And what is karma? Uh, uh, karma, strictly speaking, strictly speaking, um, karma is not only the, so it's not only life prana, that you need to make the body alive and integrate the body uh, that makes this wild spark. What he's talking about karma is nothing as we pranic healers call intention. So if you want to give life, right? In order to um, give something, you want to give life, you're saying the word want. So if you want, in order to want something, you have to have desire. And another word for desire is karma. All right, like you have uh, Kama Sutra. The, this is the summary of how to awaken yeah. the desire in a person. So if you want something, you have to have desire. Another word for desire is karma. So it's like in a healing, energy is not enough. Prana is not enough. You must have energy plus intention. All right. If you just project energy like that, healing is not effective. You have to project energy with intention, with desire, with, you know, focus all right so it's not just about extending the life cord and providing the life energy there must be a need or desire without desire nothing comes into manifestation all right that's why master Cho in his book he said when the higher soul wants to incarnate and the destiny of the incarnate soul has been formulated with the help of a superior being the place of body cell and then the life permanency goes down so if if it wants to incarnate there must be desire or karma Yes, yeah, I agree. So uh, when you got to remember that when you look at uh, theosophy, they say that the incarnated soul wants to learn and grow, right? And that's why we incarnate, we take this body on. And so when you come into this physical body on the earth, this is the only place where you can have these lessons learned. And uh, that is when the energy that is sent down, which we call the soul energy into this physical body is for a certain purpose. Yes, and that is your purpose of life or your destiny. So with that, you come down, hopefully driving towards that destiny. And when you leave, you hopefully learned enough to take back home. Apologies, I didn't write. It's achieving oneness with the higher soul. You didn't get priest. Okay. So. so moving on to the next part. So it says here in the next paragraph, prana is absor absorbed, yes, uh, by all living organisms, whether you talk about it with reference to a plant, whether you talk about it with reference to an animal or a human being, yes, all, all of it, all products uh, that exist in the physical realm do use this. But interestingly, I think somewhere 
uh, we forget to realize uh, what is mentioned here in the second line. It says, uh, we somehow think that the prana exists for life. It's actually the other way around. So it says here, um, you have to understand that life is a product of prana. Yes, and so the existence of animals, birds, plants, humans is because of prana. It's not the other way around. It's not that because we are there, there's prana that's there to take care of us. It's the other way around. And so I think for me, that was a new le learning, even though I've read this book a long, long time ago. And uh, so to understand that and to also recognize in, in the last sentence there, they say that anything that is too much is not good for us. <clears throat> and so it says here, if there's too much of this, <clears throat> it would then affect the, the nervous system and um, it might also lead to disease that can also lead to death. At the same time, if there is less of this so-called energy within us, it can cause exhaustion and also ultimately death. So either having too much might overwhelm the physical form, including the nervous system. At the same time, too less may not be enough to allow this physical body to sustain itself. So like um, Amit mentioned, you have, yes, the soul energy that is there to keep the whole thing going. And we have the so-called prana that we know in healing that is required to continue to see to it. Just like we have uh, within our body, we have, uh, they call, uh, I think it's Blavatsky, yes. Uh, H.P. Blavatsky actually compares prana to oxygen. And she says, just like oxygen is so vital for this particular body, right? She says it's a supporter of combustion, um, the life-giving gas, the active chemical agent for organic life. Uh, similarly, you have prana that is required for, for this body to sustain itself, physical body and energy body to survive. And so she equivalents uh, prana to oxygen. At the same time, she also draws a comparison between the etheric double, the energy body, to nitrogen. Right, And so she says that uh, just like nitrogen, it's an inert gas, but it, it needs to combine itself with oxygen. And so it becomes more adaptable for the animal respiration uh, system and also for other organic substance. And so the prana along with the energy body is what we're going to go into in, in due course. However, um, just to remember that <clears throat> this prana, uh, there are two aspects. Uh, so we will call one soul energy and the other one as just normal uh, energy or normal prana. Two of it aspects so far. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now the aspect of the cat, I, I still don't get that. So I'm going to skip that paragraph and go to it after this. So I'm with all yours. Um, okay. Now, um, prana is absorbed by all uh, living uh, organisms and all that stuff. So basically it says the same thing that it did earlier in chapter <laughs> one. It says basically once again, we're talking about how prana is necessary for physical life to exist. Okay. This was already covered in chapter one. I gave you guys the quotes from uh, Master Chua's book. So uh, that's already there. So here he's probably talking about etheric prana. Finally, he's talking about etheric prana. Uh, since he mentions, how, how do we know? Since he mentions it is for the organisms that are living or for life to exist. Okay. Um, now, um, living uh, animal, plant, etc. are its products. Uh, to make you understand, uh, to give you an analogy, so it's like a, and build on what Sumi was saying, so it's like a company, okay, you can look at the company as a soul, that needs ma um, uh, money or prana to create products, all right? And the money and the company, once it's, uh, you know, incorporated for it to survive, all right, it, this company can survive due to a continuous inflow and outflow of money. All right. Um, with the, with the money is essential for the physical existence of the company. All right. So prana is essential for the physical existence of the body of the plant, animals, etc. All right. So if a company wants to make pr uh, products, they can't have. They cannot. They cannot. The money is prana. So to create products, um, the the company needs money. So that's what I was looking at as an analogy. And the other part, too great and abundant uh, and exuberance. I love these older, you know, I don't need these words anymore, but of it, of, uh, of it in the nervous system may lead to disease and death, just as too little leads to exhaustion and ultimately death. What is this? This is basically congestion and depletion <laughs> in pranic healing. All right. So too much energy will lead to a problem with the body. And uh, too little of energy will also lead a problem to the body. This is one of the reasons why the existence of the Ming Min Chakra was kept a secret. Um, as using that energy uh, center, you can control 
actually one of the major distribution networks, especially of ground prana within the body. And that's why we need to exercise some caution when using the uh, master healing technique. Now it says on the physical uh, plane, prana builds up all minerals, controlling energy. Have, have you finished this? No. Yeah, yeah, Madam Blavatsky. Ah, okay. So here, Madam Blavatsky compares prana to be as vital in oxygen um, and the etheric double, which will. So here, Madam Blavatsky compares prana to be as vital as oxygen, and the etheric double uh, is something that is that will regulate the flow of prana. All right, to be nitrogen. So it's an analogy. So which makes the so if you look at oxygen, oxygen on its own is not safe for consumption. It is nitrogen that give, makes it safe for consumption. At least that's what I remember from my chemistry long, long <laughs> time ago. Okay, I might be wrong. All right, I read once also that oxygen is the only known agent to support combustion. Combustion. All right, nitrogen on its own cannot support combustion at all. All right. So the analogy is to, that they're trying to make is that prana is like oxygen that is vital for existence of all life, but you need the etheric body to handle, all right, and to regulate the flow of prana uh, within the physical system or within the living organism, all right. Um, now, the cat being pre-eminently uh, endowed with prana, I, I'll take a guess. I, I'm not, I have to sit and now scan cats because based on what they said, if you see the word, it is, uh, if you look at the meaning, pre-eminently endowed with prana, prana yeah. Uh, that means, uh, and it has nine lives. It probably means that the cat has so much prana because they're preeminently endowed with it. You know, uh, they have so much prana that it seems to be nine lives worth. All right, uh, it's like nine lives worth of life force is there within that animal. Okay, um, flowing through that system, and that's why the Egyptians probably kept it around because it was probably like if it has nine lives worth of uh, uh, prana, maybe we should also get a cat. It's like a portable pranic battery. Okay, it's carry around. <laughs> so. I, I really don't know about that. Uh, but yes, I, I do know that when I uh, did travel and I still travel into um, Egypt, there are a lot of cats. Just like we have street dogs, they have street cats. There are many countries that have just street cats and there's so many of them in every nook and corner, right? So that could be one understanding that they have, uh, that it has so much of energy that it could be used. Uh, it's similar to when you have young kids around, right? So if you're a teacher in, in a nursery school, the kids have so much energy that even if you're depleted, their energy, you know, you kind of absorb it and you, you feel good. I've never really found um, nursery teachers, you know, grumpy and, and rude and, and nasty. Usually they, they're full of life as well. And, and they're a lot of fun, usually, the, the teachers who teach these little kids. So they are also like little energy batteries that give off so much energy that you and I will feel good. Uh, with them. That's why grandparents love uh, their grandkids, I think. One of the reasons is definitely the energy and, and what they, they come with. Should yeah. we uh, stop? Yes, I think uh, we have about seven, eight minutes. So and I have another of, session to get to. Yes, <laughs> to Amit do. has another session under the Karnataka Foundation. Round two. Uh, so what we thought is, because the next part goes into something completely different from what we've done so far, uh, instead of starting it and breaking it off, which might become... Uh, if you want, we can finish this last part. The, uh, no, there's two parts of that. Right? Yeah, no, so... The, no, the, what about the mineral controlling chemical? Uh, you want to, Okay, so you can finish that. No, is that because part of it or it continues here? Um, it does continue with reference to um, the connection. Okay, between. then we'll better we start that. We'll leave it at the well-endowed uh, cat. Actually, today <laughs> well-endowed means something else for men. Uh, it says correct. Uh, no, it's okay, Amit. We don't want to preeminently endowed. That's okay. So, if you have any questions, I thought we'll take some questions uh, before we end. So you can put your, you know, blue hand there, and then we'll come to you. Okay. So going to the chats first. Where's the chat? Shall we stop the share? Uh, yeah, yeah, you okay. can. So you can go to the questions. Uh, can you go to the first one? So we'll see quickly that we don't miss. Okay. Atma namaste. Atma namaste to you. Atma namaste to you. Atma namaste to you. Question in page six, paragraph four, line three. Wow, that's really uh, paragraph four, line three. When materialization formed of matter, when so ether and injury to the form, I already explained this. It says the double becomes more vitalized as the energy in the dense diminishes. Yeah, I explained this whole thing with the quotation of master. Right, and also we had a principle of correspondence, right? Yes, uh, anyway, it doesn't. Yeah, Dr. Uh, 
No, I was just thinking, you know, when the, the, the uh, anesthesia, right? That's yeah. Major, yeah. This, Same thing again, right? Yes, the recording is available. Kundalini is from Earth, yes, but um, the Earth is also a transformer. The Earth is the planetary parabrahman. I don't know, this is not part of that. Anyway. <laughs> when we invoke to the Supreme Being, is it the solar um, being? Master Chua says, yes, that's as far as our prayers can reach at this point. Yeah? Um, but I think in existence of God, he says, when we say Supreme God, we mean planetary Parabrahman. But here they're very advanced. They're going to the solar Correct. Uh, But to help you to even go there, probably you need to evolve to a certain uh, yeah. extent. But yes, in, in general, for the uh, common man, it would be only the planetary Parabrahman. Yeah. In the book, it and says... And the being that answers is uh, the Buddha Kuan Yin. In the book... Avla, yeah, Avla, I'll answer Avla, these two Avla. and I'll go. In the book, it says that it has no connection with the outpourings. Uh, yeah, Deepa, it's uh, changed. There's a there's a Correct. side note. So, I have a side no, no, note. No, it's there in all the books. It's just, a, if you just look at it, it says page 21. So, you go there, it'll change the thing, depending on your edition. It says with note on page 21, all right, at the bottom. So, yeah. they changed it after... Uh, uh, Led Beatles, Bishop Led Chakras, Beatles uh, Chakra, Chakra book. book yeah. So once the Chakra book uh, came out, they, they did notice that there was a connection. And so that connection of the outpourings was then mentioned. So I have that footnote here and that's why I added what I did. If Prana is coming from solar God, why not much life exists in other planets? How do you know it doesn't exist? It just might not exist in the way you expect it to exist in physical form. But in etheric form and other forms, it it, it, it it is. exists. Yeah. So if you go to the textbook of Theosophy, Sorry, um, Amit will have. See you guys. Yes. At um, he needs to go Sutra to Atma head. is thread from the soul. It's in the soul. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you Amit. All right. So um, coming back to what you were asking, uh, one is with reference to the uh, solar being. If you go to the uh, textbook of Theosophy, we have some recordings there. Uh, one second. What do you want? He took it from there. Okay, sorry. So uh, coming back to uh, the existence of God um, and also the textbook of Theosophy, if you go through those uh, recordings, you do understand that there is life that exists on other planets as well. With reference to physical body, we're the only planet that has a physical body. That's the dense physical body. But there is, uh, remember, there's etheric, there is astral, and there's mental bodies as well that we all have. So the prana also vibrates at different frequencies. Yes, because the different uh, pranas that we're going to talk about uh, maybe tomorrow, hopefully, there, there's astral prana. Yes, there's also mental prana. There's, uh, of course, the prana in the etheric body, and we've talked more about that as well. So yes, they, they would be all on different frequencies. Uh, Sutra Atma. Uh, Sutra is thread uh, and Atma is the soul. So the thread that comes or the connection that comes from uh, the soul, the higher soul or the Atma to us, the Jivatma or the incarnated soul. Yeah. Okay. Is the web the health aura? No. Uh, the health aura is nothing got to do with what you're talking about, this particular web, uh, the golden web that uh, we were considering. Uh, that is literally from that Sutra Atma coming down. You know, when we say that we are infinite light and the light goes pose down and outwards it's it's within that light that these uh, these amazing strings uh, kind of come if you watched um, i know this is not a very good example but if you've watched um, avatar if you remember you know those people have something like a long plait kind of thing and those there are these strands coming out yes and then they connect it to their their kind of hoss uh, it's something like that it comes and there's like millions of those strands that that go through your entire um, energy system Uh, the shape of the health aura is rectangular. Um, Jaya, um, in Master Cho's book, it's definitely not rectangular. So I'm not too sure which book you're referring to. So our understanding, it's not rectangular at all. Uh, it kind of uh, follows more or less the shape of the body. So it's more like, uh, like an upside down egg. Does the earth uh, electromagnetic field impact prana in human beings, uh, the nervous system? Um, at this point, Amita, I'm not aware if the electromagnetic field affects the prana uh, with reference to the nervous system. But yes, uh, the direction of 
of the earth, yes, that's not South, East and West based on Feng Shui does affect us. Has Master mentioned this at any point? Not that I'm aware of, yeah? So we'll see if, uh, if Amit has heard anything uh, when he was uh, back with Master Chua. Maybe there was something there. What type of prana does money have? Prosperity prana. <laughs> Prosperity energy is all I can say. I am from Egypt. Yes, Tariq, I've attended your Arhati Yoga prep course. Yes, thank you, Tariq. Um, glad to know that, and I hope this class helps you understand more. Okay, so going to Rahul. Um, so he says, does web made by spiders are similar to the meridians that clairvoyants see around physical body or humans? Well, I've not really looked at the spider web because it's, it's also circular, but if you look at it, it, it looks kind of rectangular. So maybe it's, it's similar in, in a different um, 3D dimension, probably, but um, I've not really known if it is similar. Okay, since prana interpenetrates physical form, can't these pranas be used to transmute non-visible COVID-19? or are we actually doing the same during meditation? Uh, you see, if your energy is of a certain type, uh, it's very difficult for a virus to affect you. So even if you do a meditation and you have a brilliant aura and, and your chakras are clean and feeling, you're feeling healthy, a problem is during the day, if you get emotional and you get upset and angry, then those energies uh, will then disappear, making your body more, uh, your immune system as well, which is becoming more, um, it's, it's, it cannot defend your body as it could before, and therefore prone to more viruses, including probably COVID-19. So we have to try and see to it that we stay, stay in a state of uh, better emotional and mental health, yeah? Hope that helps you. All right. Okay, body sculpting means changing etheric body. Uh, yes, Bharati, it is. Uh, so you do try and sculpt the energy body according to the shape that you want this physical body to correspond to in due course, right? But remember, before you shape, you have to do enough cleansing, enough purification, both on the physical and psychological level. What is the next session? Um, are you talking about Amit's session or are you talking about this session? The next session is on Monday. What we're talking about, Amit, uh, he has a local, uh, he's, he's from the Pranic Healing Foundation of Karnataka. And so he has his own session that they're doing for the local foundation. Um, I'm not too sure about uh, what it is, but it's, it, if you know anybody from Karnataka, please ask them. I know I'm from Karnataka, but asking me doesn't help. <laughs> I, I don't usually uh, check all those messages. Link for recording, uh, Gitanjali, we'll ask Aditya to help you. Gitanjali 722. Okay, Tarek, how can someone heal the Kundalini syndrome problem uh, in his current life if he has it from a previous incarnation because of lack of purification? So whether you have lack of purification from a previous lifetime, you see those qualities that you haven't been able to purify earlier still stay within you, in your uh, astral and in your mental uh, state. And so that tendency to say become jealous or irritation uh, or feeling low, these kind of tendencies are, is, a late, is a very old tendency that you have. And so this lifetime, what you need to do is try and overcome it. And you will have a lot of opportunities with people around giving you that chance to try and overcome this limitation. Yes. And so they're going to help you see to it that you can actually become uh, more understanding of them, not uh, to realize that, hey, you know what? Everyone gets what they are due. So if one is more wealthy or one gets a, a better opportunity than you, then you need to work towards it. Or you haven't earned enough, uh, karmically speaking, to have what someone else has. So once you start to understand that everything is balanced, then you won't feel so bad that you have less or he has more. So with your understanding, with your learnings, uh, both intelligence, uh, personal experiences, and also through your purification, you can slowly overcome uh, the limitations that you have. Yeah, and so Shankar, thank you, has given, um, I think, uh, Gitanjali the recording uh, details. Tarek, uh, and is it related to psychiatric diseases like bipolar? So you could have um, all kinds of problems. Uh, it could be bipolar, it could be depression, everything coming from earlier times. A tendency because of what you have done earlier, 
uh, now you have to go through it and, and, and try and figure out a way to come out of it. Yeah, so yes, all tendencies, um, addictions that we have are all from earlier weaknesses that we need to work on. All right, how many types of prana do we have in, in human form? Okay, uh, what are the pranas that the different seeds have? Now, the different seeds uh, which we're referring to or uh, the seeds that come through the Sutratma from the higher soul are basically seeds or the prana from that, those different levels, helping to also create the bodies of those different levels with reference to what we need to have, right? So whether it's energy body, whether it's astral body, whether it's mental body, through that, they're able to do this. Now, interestingly, which we will come to later, is that these bodies, when we have them, they are not built by the energy. The prana doesn't build it. They're actually beings who actually come to build these bodies for you. Yeah. So we'll come to that in a bit. And so, yes, we do have different bodies and the prana that we need um, as such for the physical body to survive is basically sun, earth and air prana other than the soul energy or the soul prana. Um, Anjali, whether Rua is the integrating force, Rua is a prana that is required for the sustenance of the physical body. But uh, the other, uh, which we were referring to, um, that one is the one that keeps everything together, right? So one is the one that keeps everything together, but the prana for the cells, for it to survive, the prana that goes out, which is already used prana, and then takes in new prana, that is a different prana. Yeah, so that is Rua, uh, whereas the one that sustains itself is, uh, um, I forgot the name, Nef, Nefak. I'm, I'm not sure of spelling. I need to look at the book again. Yeah, so that's basically it. Uh, what are the other names of etheric body? It's called the etheric double. It's called the energy body. Uh, it's called the Pranamaya Kosha. It's called the Doppelganger. So there's a whole bunch of names that we looked at in chapter one. So if you just go back a couple of pages, you'll find uh, uh, many names for the energy body. What is laser light used for healing in Western medicine? Uh, can we equate that with something close to pranic practices or prana when we're talking about it? Uh, so with reference to laser light, uh, the use for healing in, in Western medicine is to be more accurate and to be able to go exactly to the point where they need to, to work on. And so for me, the closest in pranic healing is uh, the use of crystals, the laser crystals that help then point the energy because from that point, the energy that comes out is so focused and so potent that it can go deep inside the physical body to heal parts that are affected. Yeah. So that's the closest that I can think of. Is there anyone, um, is there only one divine spark or each soul has one? All spiritual teachers come from the love aspect of the planetary God or the Supreme God. All right. Uh, so with reference to the divine spark, each one of us has our own divine spark. Uh, and therefore, each incarnated soul has its own higher soul and its own uh, divine spark. Ultimately, of course, all the divine sparks will come together. And uh, the spiritual teacher, all teachers, yes, or whether you call them religious teachers, spiritual teachers, all come from the love aspect of God. And at this point, it comes from the second aspect of God or the solar deity or the solar being. Yeah, for our, for our solar system, it comes from there. Okay, can Krillian photography used to detect coronavirus. Um, Devraj, I'm, I'm not too sure if there's any studies being done with uh, this instrument and coronavirus, so I'm sorry about that. Can we fa finish uh, physical exercises before the shower and can we heal when we have our periods? All right, so yes, you can do your physical exercises before your shower and if you have your periods, no problem healing other people, absolutely not a problem. Okay, that's that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, people, not bad. We actually finished just five minutes ahead of time. Um, I wanted to also share something that um, Dr. Sagar mentioned. Yes, with reference to anesthesia. Um, he did mention to us, uh, it was very sweet of him to share. Remember when we were talking about anesthesia and uh, it was mentioned when, when, uh, when Amit was taking the session, if you go back to the earlier pages, and they talk about, um, you know, what happens to the eyes of the person 
when they go through anesthesia or when the etheric body is pulled out. Let me just find that line. Actually, it's easier in my book rather than the online one. One sec. Okay, so it says when the double is projected by a trained expert, right? So the trained expert actually uh, gets this uh, etheric body detached from the dense body. The body gets torpid. The mind is brown uh, study or day state. The eyes are lifeless in expression and the heart and lungs feeble. And other, and other than that, the temperature also is lowered. Yes. And uh, so uh, Dr. Sagar had actually mentioned that when this happens, uh, this has actually got to do with anesthesia. So instead of me repeating it, I would request Dr. Sagar uh, to kindly explain that there are different levels of anesthesia. And the third stage of anesthesia, he says, is basically what's written here. So I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself, doctor, and please share what you shared with us. Because I thought it was interesting and it's good for people to know. Please do. Atman uh, Master Sumi, thank you very much. Uh, well, am I audible? Yes. Okay. Uh, so when we talk about in medical grounds, on medical side, we have anesthesia has uh, like five stages. The first stage, first stage and second stage is called as induction phase. That is when we make the patient anesthetized. The next stage comes the maintenance phase and then fourth, fifth, I'll talk later. The first and second stage when we give anesthesia, we give the inhalational drugs, we give some IV injections as well. The patient is conscious and the moment he becomes unconscious, he goes to a very short stage of hyper excitable where the pulse blood pressure rises but which is a very short stage then the body goes on autopilot mode that is the autonomic system nervous system takes up the pulse and blood pressure and we notice on the monitor the pulse is perfectly fine the blood pressure is fine the respiration is very regular so this is called the maintenance phase which the body owns uh, own uh, autonomous so the role of anesthesia at this stage is only to make the brain unconscious or the, the body unconscious. Now, for example, now for the, if the dose given higher at this stage, these parameters may change and the pulse and uh, uh, the respiration rate goes into depression and all those stages, which was just, uh, Sumi was reading the paragraph that the eyeball movements and the flexes, they also go away we can eventually lead to death. Obviously, we don't want that to happen during surgery, so they never go to the stage four and five. So I take it as it's like a partial separation of the etheric double from the physical body in stage three. It is not a complete separation. That's just my own understanding from this. And uh, what else, Sumi? I think that's it. All right. Thank you, doctor. Appreciate that. And I'm sure the others also enjoyed uh, that bit of information. So remember, we mentioned that uh, when the etheric body, because it's a bridge between the physical body, the physical brain with the other bodies. So when there's anesthesia, this etheric body is pulled out. Yes. And then what it does, it, it kind of wraps itself around the astral body. And so when it does that to the astral body, the astral body's consciousness also becomes dull. And so the brain no longer has a bridge to kind of remember and recollect what happened at that point. Yes, and so that's why they say that at this point, the brain actually doesn't show any activity. So it's interesting that as soon as even the etheric body is removed from the physical body, the physical body really is, um, doesn't have anything there to kind of coordinate itself. And so the doctors do all that they can to kind of help uh, the whole system function. Yes, doctor? Of course, the aut autonomous, uh, what did you call it? The which system did you say? Unmute. Yeah, it's autonomic nervous system, which yeah. means parasympathetic yeah. and sympathetic system. Yeah. yeah. So they set into a motion to help the body uh, continue to cope. Uh, and Sumi, how do we explain the why the uh, the patient does not remember anything during the surgery? We, uh, I mean, I I say we. Sorry, being the medical person. Yes, of course. So it's because they think the brain is totally knocked out. There's no possible between the different uh, aspects of the brain communicating with each other. So there's no memory. The hippocampus, which is the memory thing, doesn't work. Right. So that's all. 
Thank you. So basically meaning that when the energy even from the brain is taken out because there's no etheric uh, double there, then the brain also can't register anything. So it's interesting to see how these teachings that were written a hundred years ago, uh, along with medical science does make sense to us. All right. So with that, uh, can we end with a short prayer, please? Kindly close your eyes, connect unto the palate. Thank you for being with us. To the Supreme Being, the Divine Father, Divine Mother, to our beloved and respected teacher, Grand Master Chokoks, we Lord Maha Guruji Meili, to Buddha Kwani and Buddha Sakyamuni, to Gautama Buddha, to the Lord Christ, Lord Yehoshua Ba Miriam, to Lord Shiva, Lord Ganesha, all the angels, teachers, and great masters of theosophy, to the angels and beings of knowledge, light, and power, to our soul and divine self, to the angels and beings of communication, our respective Wi Fi's. Thank you all for your great, great blessings for your tremendous patience with us. Thank you for greater knowledge, understanding, wisdom, and clarity. Thank you for helping us to absorb and assimilate these teachings and to have a greater understanding of who we are and what we can become. Help us to use this to become better instruments in your service. With thanks and in full faith, so be it. Thank you, everybody. Atma Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Sagar. Appreciate what you gave us. And uh, thank you, everybody. We'll see you on Monday. Enjoy your weekend. Have a good, good end of May. Let's start the new month. Hopefully things will start to change. The rains are here in Bangalore, changing the weather. Hopefully also the conditions. Yes, thank you. Bye. Have a wonderful weekend.